My name is Richard Lowenberg. Welcome to the Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024 program, uh, being uh, carried by Leonardo Laser Zooms around the world and uh, locally uh, in Telluride, Colorado, where I am. And where also uh, Mark Nairink, one of the presenters, is. Uh, we're also going to be joined by Eric Smith, uh, who happens to be in Tokyo at the moment, and uh, Edwin Valentin, who is in Göttingen in the Netherlands. Um, they're all a variation of physicists, among other things. Um, and I'll only do very brief introductions, but this program. Uh, is uh, one in a series of 12 uh, Zoom discussions, presentations on the nature of information, uh, a subject we all uh, deal with in our daily lives more and more, and yet very few uh, really understand what information is. And uh, my amateur sense is that in physics, uh, and in uh, semantics and other areas of information, we don't really know what information is. And I'm always reminded that uh, Richard Feynman was known for saying energy. We don't know what that is. Uh, and uh, But we will, uh, over 12 laser zooms, be discussing various uh, uh, approaches, understandings, and example settings um, by some remarkable presenters uh, about the nature of information from the foundations of the universe to the uh, micro scale of uh, lipids, proteins, uh, RNA, DNA, uh, and the origin of life, in fact. Um, and so to begin this session, I'd like to introduce uh, David Eric Smith, uh, who I met a few years back at the Santa Fe Institute, one of his many uh, uh, residencies and places of involvement. Uh, and uh, we're also joined by Edwin Valentin, uh, who uh, every two years or approximately that uh, hosts the Information Universe uh, Conference, uh, which uh, Eric Smith has been part of, and Mark Nairink has been part of in the past. Um, and Mark is also a physicist, cosmologist, uh, these days based in Denver. And I'll let each of them introduce themselves in greater detail. But let's uh, begin and uh, welcome David Eric Smith. Hello, David. Take it away. Richard, hi. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much for letting me be part of this. Thank you for the introduction, Richard. Um, I won't say maybe too much about myself. I'll say more about the ideas. Just from the opening slide, do want to mention for any of you who don't happen to work in these areas, it really takes a village. So it's kind of surprising how many institutions it takes to maintain a person's ideas. And the stuff that I'll talk to you about uh, has been informed by people at all of these places and more. Richard originally asked that in introductory remarks, we just kind of raise some ideas that would be available to discuss among the group of us. And so I thought I might look at these. The meeting is about information quite broadly. I was asked to talk about information in the biological sciences. We can set this up as maybe a kind of dichotomy. How we think about information today in the thriving areas of biological science that use it extensively versus how we need to think about it if we wanna understand the origin of life. And this will be a difference between us as kind of passive, ob passive observers for whom information theory is what we use to study a biosphere that we take for given versus recognizing that the planet was doing information theory to make a biosphere possible. So the elements of this contrast are, I wanna go back to the idea of cause and the way that Darwin broke from certain medieval notions 
that started in an idea of impetus, and say that the Darwinian notion of cause, adaptation, is inherently an information theoretic model. What we do in the domain called bioinformatics is basically to describe and try to quantify this information that adaptation puts into systems. If in contrast to that, we wanna understand the problem of the origin of life, we have to look at the fact that the systems that put information into life, if you will, are kind of like siphons. You have to have information to start in order to get more information. And so they create chicken egg dilemmas, both in the machinery and in the information theory. And once we recognize that some of that starting information was needed to operate the ratchet, we can recognize that even today there are ways that life is still relying on the mechanisms that provided that from the start. So then we're inclined to ask what and how big were the needs for information to get started and what were the sources that fulfilled them? So a theme of this meeting, of course, especially since it's an art science meeting, is that the word information can point at a great number of different things. So if I wanna use it, I need to tell you what I mean. My use of the term is gonna be a pretty standard one, a pretty classical one. The idea will be that we start with some wider distribution of possibilities uh, that's involved in asking some question. And then we say, oh, wait, I know more than I told you. I know this additional thing, and that's gonna narrow the distribution of possibilities somewhat. We wanna ask, is there a natural measure of how much more you know when I've told you I'm narrowing the distribution? So for example, let's say I wanna ask something about people and I wanna answer it by taking a distribution of people like all of the Olympic athletes grouped by body size. That's my prior distribution. And then I say, oh wait, actually I wanna ask you something about the high jumpers in particular. Well, what do we know? Independently of sort of how many people are in the world of every body size, and that tends to be kind of bell curve distributed because they're only, there's only such a range that you can make as a human. The nature of the high jump is that it's intrinsically easier for taller people because it's about getting over something tall. And so the event itself, no matter how many people are presented to it, will tend to sample more of them from the ones that are taller. So if I describe the event, I say, okay, from any given starting pool, the number that make it to the Olympics is gonna to tend to be higher among the taller ones and fewer among the shorter ones. If we had asked about gymnastics, it would have been the other way, you know, small light body is the easier thing to do. So these are my two things that I know now, how many people the world of humanity presents to the sport and how much sort of advantage the sport presents in selecting among them. If I take the product of those two, I get the distribution of the high jumpers, which is gonna be shifted a little to the tall side from the distribution of all the athletes. But I didn't say anything about the scale of this red dashed line here. And so this sort of pink distribution, the size of it doesn't really mean anything yet. I need to make a size correction. What I need to do while keeping the shape is ask out of the original gray distribution, what part of it is being accounted for by the sub distribution that contains this additional criterion that we're looking at just the high jumpers. If I measure their sizes as a fraction in a way that doesn't depend on the absolute size, that's what this e to the superscript notation means, I get this quantity s, which gives me the sort of ratio of the distribution with the additional criterion to the distribution without it as a function of how much it's shifted. This n is just how much the distribution shifted. When I say information, this is the usage I will intend. This is the complete, this is the source of all of our ideas of entropy in the physical sciences. It's the standard notion of information that's used in computation and communication. And it's also what the sort of daily work of bioinformatics uses. So that's information in my hands for these little remarks. Let's switch and talk instead about the idea of cause. Cause is a very old notion. We've had it probably as long as we've had language. And in ordinary life, and again in science, we keep needing to change what we mean by that. So it's changed from the ancient Greeks into the era of mechanics. It's changed repeatedly within mechanics, and then it underwent another radical change with Darwin's ideas. 
So across all these changes, what is it that makes cause a kind of still common idea? I think we can say that cause always entails some notion of a before and an after. There's something that's the causer and something that's the caused. I won't go all the way back to Aristotle, where cause is kind of bound up with this complicated wish to have a, a total theory of change, which is in itself a problem notion. But we'll start right at kind of the boundary of the Middle Ages with John Philoponus or John the Grammarian, a Greek called to Alexandria, who introduced the idea of impetus as the, the cause of motion in mechanics. The important thing about the idea of impetus, which was continuous in a way through Galileo and then even into Newton, it became in modern form the idea of momentum, is that this is kind of billiard ball causation, that the colored balls don't move until the cue ball or one of the others hits them and makes them move. So impetus is in John's hands, what's put into a ball to cause it to move. With Darwin, that was a thing we suddenly had to let go because Darwin, Darwinian selection is, still has a before and an after. The environment is the cause, the organism is the thing on which that cause acts, but it's not a billiard ball notation of causation anymore. It's a kind of sieving notion of causation. The sources of events, the mutations, just happen on their own without respect to the subsequent cause. And what selection does is it keeps some and rejects others. So we recognize that ad adaptation through selection is still a cause, a form of causation. It has a before and an after, but it's the pattern that's being caused, not the movement. So with Darwin for the first time since the beginning of the Middle Ages, we have separated mechanics from the idea of the causing relation. So right away, we can see from what we said about information that Darwin's notion of cause is inherently defined in terms of information. So selection, the thing about the environment that does what we're calling the causing, is exactly this act of pruning an available palette of prior variations into the posterior things that are realized as the sort of persisting variation. So to, to make this material, instead of thinking about high jumpers, think about the crocodilians. If you're not too big and you can hunt a variety of things on land or in the water, then maybe broad, strong jaws are to your advantage and you wind up being an American alligator. That's, that's the easier way to be. Or suppose you're so big that land is almost unusable to you and all your hunting has to be done in the water like the Garial of uh, India and Asia. In that case, wide jaws that squirt water out of the way are not an advantage in catching fish. Instead, you need narrow jaws that can cut through the water to catch small, agile, quick fish. So you present the palette of all the different ways a body can form to selection through the ages. The ones that survive give you the distribution of the crocodilians we see in the world today. If we look at this informational idea from a molecular biology perspective, the story is kind of simple. There's a, a very simplified version coined by Francis, Francis Crick called the central dogma. And the idea is just the one that we all know, you know, we take it in from the common uh, culture that the instructions for building an organism are contained in the genome. And then a bunch of complicated stuff happens and it builds you an animal or it builds you a plant, some individual. From a molecular level, the machinery that does all of this is this kind of ratchet here, where the DNA is carrying this information in the chromosomes, and it tells you how to make an RNA, which tells you how to make a particular protein. The protein does the work of the cell making the small metabolites, and then those are the raw material out of which all these other molecules are built. You then take the different separated environments, like the subtropical regions that are friendly to being a crocodilian, and the selective filters in each case, and you wind up with the distribution of types and relations that we see. So bioinformation, bioinformaticians sort of take this whole story about the central dogma that has put information into living systems, and then they wanna to try to quantify this. I need to tell you a little about how they do this. Um, 
they work on long sequence strings. This is what a genome looks like. It's a, a long string of letters. Now, what these letters stand for is amino acids. The fact that I write them in a string refers to the fact that we remove water to bind them together into a long chain. But the reason they do anything is that they clump up into a ball. Now, if you or I look at sort of a picture of all of these atoms in a ball, it doesn't look like much to us. So what we do is we draw the molecules as sticks where you can see the carbon in green, the nitrogen blue, the oxygen red. If there's a long chain like this sequence, we draw it this way. And now we have something that looks like a thorn bush. Okay, we see more, but still not too much. But then there's more than that to know. The backbones, it turns out, can be lined up against each other, and they can, by sharing a proton between carbons and nitrogens, lock themselves into that form in sheets. Or by winding into a helix, they can use the same bonds to make a different structure. We can draw the same molecule as a kind of cartoon. And now we start to see that there's a lot of particularity here. And this is both related to the structure and to the function. So bioinformaticians can ask sort of, what is it about the sequence that's giving you that structure? And they have lots of great tools for doing this. This is a tool written by some of my colleagues and friends at Georgia Tech. You take a molecule that has a particular structure, maybe you plot the way it looks in 3D space or the way its sheets and its helices string together in the sequence. Then you take a whole variety of different organisms and you can line up the parts of their sequences that are building this molecule in each case. And now you can look at how much any given position can change as a result of being this under selection in the world. And for the bioinformaticians, they can distinguish the positions like here, kind of in the middle, that seem to admit a lot of change. Those seem to be free. They don't seem to be selected. So those are uninformative. From the other positions like this R here or this G here that seem to admit no variation at all. So those have, the letters could have been anything. The amino acids could be there, but selection has not permitted them to remain. So those are the ones that carry your information. And there are lots of sophisticated ways to look at these, uh, to compare how much information is in them. We can paint these structures with the intensity of selection. And then we can talk about what the information is about in terms of structure or function or historical groupings. But now we have a problem because we said that there's a ratchet for putting this information into living systems. But if I want to make one of these proteins that has to fold in order to do something, it needs to have a certain minimum size in order to be capable of folding. And if we look at the very old folds and where there's sort of sequence information written into them, the size that they need to fold is bigger than the ranges of sort of letter by letter design. So what we find in the very old folds and continuing into the modern era is that they use an ordinary physical thing, symmetry, to get them over the threshold that makes folding possible while reusing sequence design in smaller units. And so we see cases where there's two-fold symmetry or, or three or four or six or eight. And this is something that's not coming in from Darwin. It's coming in just from the laws of space filling and the ability to repeat something to kind of get you over the threshold to accomplish a physical task while requiring less sequence specificity, but reusing it. But that's only a part of our problem. You know, I showed you this picture of the ratchet of the central dogma. We need all of this molecular structure in order to operate this ratchet. So we have a chicken egg dilemma. The information in the big molecules makes the little molecules, but they are the raw material out of which the big molecules is made. Natural selection can pull a lot of information from your environment into your living population, but only like a siphon, if you have the water up at the top of the tube to start with, you have to have enough information to make these molecules. And that turns out to be a bigger problem than you might imagine. If we draw nice little cartoons about how translation is made with the transfer RNAs being lined up against the messenger RNAs by this orange blob here, to stitch together, these are the amino acids carried on the end to make the chain that I showed you. Okay, that looks good in a textbook and it's good that we, we show it in this cartoon form. But if you look at that orange blob in molecules and here I'm not showing you the atoms, I'm just showing you the cartoon. This is a monster. 
This is on the order of a third of a million atoms, every one in a particular place in space. And so if we wanna understand how the ratchet of the central dogma ever came into existence, we have to figure out how you get to this or to the precursors of this in a world where initially it did not exist. So this leads us to look back at where chemistry is done and where other things are done. If I look at the whole range of chemical things in the biosphere, it turns out that they have certain sizes. Chemistry is done only for small things. There are the tiny little metabolites. So this is formaldehyde or this is vinegar. These are the building blocks out of which everything is made and they're all small. I can continue to do a little bit more chemistry and make things of intermediate size. These are the vitamins that we mostly don't make. We have to get them from eating and plants don't even make them for the most part. Many of them have to be made by soil bacteria. So this links us in ecosystems, but you don't make anything bigger than this to a good approximation by doing chemistry. Everything bigger, this extraordinary world of other things only exists by virtue of folding. So it's as if the rules of folding as a system were a kind of a gateway that everything chemical had to go through in order for its existence to have even been possible. And I think we can say, I think it's appropriate to refer to this as a kind of information gateway. This is what gets you to a folded world in order to make the ratchets that then elaborate the complexity in that folded world. So if we think there are such gateways, we're led to questions, and I'll, I'll finish with these as kind of questions we can discuss. How many such gateways are there? Uh, where is this externally supplied information coming from? What kinds of rule systems? How much information can any of them provide? How much is needed to get over one or another threshold? And then very importantly, how did the potential for life to originate and how are the forms in which it can persist contingent on the, the sort of ongoing provision of information from these gateway sources. So I will stop here and turn it over to the others. And if we like, we can come back and talk about some of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, and we will come back to that. I hope we have time for a, a discussion among uh, our three presenters today. <clears throat> uh, Right now, let's just move directly to Edwin Valentin, who will tell a bit about himself and his uh, involvements, as well as his presentation for today. Hello, Edwin. Hello, Richard. Oh, wait for my presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for inviting us and giving me the uh, opportunity to present here. It's really uh, fun to do. Um, well, I, I was uh, 17 years old when I decided to uh, study astronomy and I stayed astronomer for the rest of my life. Um, setting out for the big questions in astronomy and the mysteries of the universe. And I worked a lot on dark matter, which was one of my main topics. I also have worked on many different observatories in, on the ground and in space. And uh, that made me actually a specialist also in information technology. So this is the strange uh, bridge between uh, information technology and dark matter, and which is actually one of the strange topics of my talk. Um, I will give you a little bit of bird eye, bird eye view on, say, a perception of the information universe. Um, it's also painted in the Book of Powers of Two. Um, this many co-authors have contributed to, and some of them are also in this presentation. And uh, uh, also, Eric and, uh, and Mark are actually present on uh, one of those editions. So, um, bird eyes views. I, I'm the, the the ultimate quest is is there and is there any holistic aspect in information? Is it something which is leading has a leading role in the development and the source and the origin of our universe? I don't think we have the answer, but I will give a, a I give you a lot of projections in the coming slides coming 25 minutes on uh, how we can look at this. And uh, let me first start with this uh, classical picture. Uh, I like to discriminate between the information universe in vitro, which is uh, 
In other words, in silico, which is the information carried by our computers and our computing systems, and in vivo, in nature and in physics. And actually, that was also the topic Eric has just uh, touched. Um, strange property of both domains is that um, their total information content, which we equate as entropy, uh, on the left side, there's the Shannon entropy, and on the right side, there's the entropy in thermal systems. And you can see that both equations are more or less the same. You sum over all the possible states of the system. The biggest difference is the uh, insertion of the uh, Boltzmann constant on the in vivo universe. Actually, this notion was uh, first made by E.T. James uh, a long time ago. And uh, he noted it and he found it very peculiar. But he said the fact that they, these two equations look that identical doesn't mean that they are identical. And this is one of the key questions we are trying to address in the, in the information universe. Um, but another, another important uh, notion is, um, let me see how I play with this. Yeah, is that another important notion of uh, Shannon was that ICT is information com communication technology. So it's not only about information, it's also about communication. Actually, it goes one step further. Uh, in information technology, information only exists when it's being copied. That's a little bit wild statement, but when you think about it, it also applies to the in vivo universe. And this is an interesting crossover between the two domains. I go to the next slide, which is, oops, that's a little bit too fast. I have to wait for the signal going over the, over the ocean. So this is an epic picture um, of the distribution of galaxies in our nearby universe. It's a map. Of the of galaxies in our universe, and we at Earth are at the center of this picture. I think. Can you see my mouse? Probably yes. Uh, we are at the center of this picture, and you see the large scale structure of galaxies in the nearby universe. You see large scale structures and strings and uh, um, patterns in, and Mark will talk about it in the in the next uh, presentation. A very strange thing of this picture is that the blue parts, the upper two on the left and top on the left, are in vivo. They are the result of measurements with our telescopes, uh, have been really measured. While on the right, on the bottom side, the, the red ones are made with the means of numerical simulations. It's the famous uh, simulation of Springer et al. published in 2006. It's a very old picture, but it is an epic picture because it shows in one blink of the eye, that with computer simulations, we can simulate the universe. And in the computer simulations, the basic ingredient was the Lambda CDM standard model, meaning a universe with dark energy that is expanding and a universe which contains cold dark matter particles. So this has been, notions of this kind has been uh, seminal for also the adoption of the Lambda CDM model. So there's a nice crossover between in vivo and vitro. Um, here's another one, but now I'm looking a little bit more at the uh, information in computing systems. Um, when I was a student in the 70s, um, I did my coding on a big IBM machine downtown in Groningen. I had to go there with my punch cards on my bicycle, and the uh, next day I could pick up the output of the computer. And if I had an error in punching, then I had to do the whole thing again the next 24 hours. So in those days, the computer was the really holy beast. Uh, and you can now, in retrospect, see that a period of that epoch of 70s and 80s and 90s as the compute-centric period. The computers were the big, the big machines, the big thing in, in the uh, information technology. That has changed when we got all this big data, uh, starting about the year 2000, and we started to make completely new perceptions of information systems. And that I call the data-centric approach, where in fact, uh, we are 
taking the computers as one of the slaves. And the big work was how to model the data centric part of the universe. What is it? What is going on there? And uh, with my group, we had to build uh, big uh, information systems for big telescopes. And we really had to sit back and think about, you know, what are we doing? And we are going to, uh, in those days, we were in, in, in terabytes. And then we went to, uh, to petabytes. And now we are in hundreds of petabytes. So we have really had to step back and think about, you know, how do you deal with the data? How do you handle this? Um, that's in the in vitro universe. And one of the strange or the notions we got is, this is all made by links. Everything there in the data center universe is links. And we set out to make models, to make systems, information systems, which everything is built on the basis of links. Databases are the main key player there, and not the computers. <clears throat> strange thing is there, if you think about links, there are many different words for the same thing. There are links, there are associations, joins, addresses, URLs, references, pointers, annotations, blockchain. Strange thing is, this is all the same thing on a meta level. There's no name even for that. That I find a very spooky thing because it's a, such an important thing in our information universe and certainly in our computers and uh, also in the in, vi in vivo universe, which I come to in a minute. So, yeah, I, I also painted here, uh, you know, an old telephone book, which is an old table before computers existed, right? And this telephone book, you know, it gives links, it gives the associations, it gives the telephone number, the name of the person, so you know from which family he is, uh, you see his name, you see his address, you know in which city he is living, uh, and you can deduce from which country and planet Earth, and he's in the solar system, et cetera, et cetera. It's rather remarkable that all these things tell all, give us all this information, and all this is built on the basis of links. I call them CAN now for simplicity to give it one name because we have many different names for exactly the same thing. Well, with CANs, we built causality in our computing system. And we built provenance and data lineage, other words for all the same thing. And actually, this is the workhorse for the information universe. And uh, I think it's both the workhorse for the in vivo information universe and the workhorse for in vitro information universe. Sometimes they give presentations on the universe as a spreadsheet. And uh, in one of the information universe conferences, I gave a little demo that you can create entangled states in a quantum mechanical sense on an Excel sheet. So yeah, this is another way of presenting crossovers and talking our way towards a more holistic interpretation of, uh, of information. Then, um, Oops, I have to be sure that I push the right button. Yeah, so using this um, data links and this uh, notion that everything in, com in complex information systems is based on links, we built the Astralized Information System, which was quite ahead of time before even the word big data was invented. We built big data federations between computers and storage and many different places in Europe. Uh, which has only one property. It links bit to it. It links everything. We monitor everything in the database and we maintain all the different links, which was the key ingredient of this system. Now, this system has, re has been reincarnated in the, in the Euclid satellite, which has been launched uh, a year ago, 1st of July last year, which is a huge experiment mapping the whole universe. Well, the whole extra galactic universe, imaging it. It's a huge uh, consortium with 15 countries, uh, eight data centers, 250 institutes, and two, more than 2,000 uh, scientists involved. And we connect this. The way we connect this is actually by links and using this paradigm of mapping everything in the database, every action, every input and output is mapped in the database. So just to give you an impression of the complexity of the data model of the Euclid satellite, this is just a painting of how different data items depend on each other. It's a very complex, as you can see, 
And sometimes we uh, we show this also in a planetarium just for fun. And uh, so you see this on the big dome and you see all the crossovers between the data items. There's not much you can learn about it. The most important thing you can learn about it, if there are too many crossovers from one side of the circle to the other side, um, your modeling of the data is not too good. You want to make it as less as possible. But this is just give you an impression of the complexity of links in modern information systems. Another aspect of information systems, these links, is actually standards. Actually, you can think of standards also as a way to make links. Um, in the in vivo universe, and uh, Eric can tell you much more about it, it's uh, language and all the, also the language and the bio world is Darwinian. In in vitro, in our machines, all the standards are made by also another Darwinian process, actually the power of big industry. There's only, uh, very, only very few examples of non-industrial standards, actually I like to show this one, this is Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, 1968, proclaiming, thou shall use ASCII. The ASCII code is just a table and it's just a really a set of links. So um, just to paint the importance of, importance of links in the causality of uh, our universe. This is another picture, there's also an epic picture. It's uh, um, more than 10 years old. Um, it looks like the map of the Earth. Of course, it's almost the map of the Earth, but actually it's only painting the links of Facebook, of users of Facebook. There's a nice illustration of how links are also in more simple systems like Facebook. Um, another uh, interesting example is the International Virt uh, Virtual Observatory, which is an endeavor which is already going on for 25 years, connecting all the databases of astronomy, astronomical databases on many different places in the world. There are more a few thousand of databases, which are all connected in one system. And when a user, a student, clicks on a certain position of the sky, he can get the data from that database wherever it is in the world. That's really a dream for a lot of uh, disciplines. Um, the reason that this was so easy for astronomers to build is that we had a sky. And the sky has allows us to index all the, all the different data items because the position of the sky is actually the main index for all this different stuff. And you don't have this in all the disciplines. So 4Pi of Trixels was really the, the way to make links and to build this extremely complex system. Well, sometimes I give lectures to other disciplines and say, well, this is nice that we do this and we can make open science and we can make everything public and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it, is very, it was been, has been an extremely hard job. The other part, the central part here shows all the different standards we had to make to build this. Uh, each block uh, represents a document, a protocol, a standard, a table. <clears throat> And these, all these documents have uh, evolved and have many different versions. So this has been an enormous amount of work. Any, all these documents and standards describe links and camps. So just to carry on, uh, I have now explained a little bit, you know, how we build causality, you know, the links in our databases and how we can build a universe as a spreadsheet. Now the other side of the compute centric uh, universe are, is the artificial intelligence and also the in vivo universe. Now, in artificial intelligence, um, all the relations, all the causality is lost in the black box of the, uh, of the data model. There's no causality in artificial intelligence. It's, it's fantastic. It can do a lot of very beautiful things and we use it in astronomy all over the place. It should be noted that, uh, you know, in a one-liner, causality is lost in translation in, uh, in artificial intelligence. And another drawback of artificial intelligence is that the models have, been have to be trained and they have to be trained with existing data and often to be annotated, um, which means that everything which you get out of artificial intelligence is a, a future which is a copy of the past. So these are two notions. 
And uh, I just take it from there and we go to the next slide because I also want to spend a few minutes on how information in the in vivo universe is behaving. And uh, yeah, I referred to several speakers at the information universe. Lori Frieden was one of the first to write a book, Phys Physics from Phys Information, how you could derive physics and even quantum mechanics from information, uh, information theory. And clearly it's very well known, the holographic principles from Siskind and Hoofd and Verlinde made a big difference uh, in understanding our universe in terms of holograms and information coded in two-dimensional surfaces. And it raises the question, is our universe one big information processing machine? The real break too, actually, this is very interesting, and there's a, there are whole journals full with papers on uh, the holographic principle, it's a fantastic subject. But the breakthrough was the uh, the the, the Bekenstein-Hawking relation, uh, which uh, describes the amount of information you could put in a black hole. That's not debated. There's a lot of debates on about holographic principle, but this relation is not debated. It, it describes the amount of information in a black hole, entropy S, as related to the area the surface area of a black hole divided by the gravitational constant. Well, for a black hole of unit radius, you can say that the information content of a black hole is 4 pi, and there is 4 pi again. So, um, actually, in the powers of two, uh, we, we, we stumbled on, onto, on a lot of 4 pi's in our universe. Um, I didn't, uh, I couldn't... Uh, didn't reproduce the, uh, the work of uh, Padnavadan, who is also one of the speakers at the university, at the information universe, who presented his theory on the big melt instead of the Big Bang, completely alternative theory, where the universe is gifted at the big at the big melt, at its origin, with four pi of information. The information content of a black hole with a unit radius is four pi. Uh, the holographic principle works on spheres, which has a force pi uh, surface. Um, the virtual observatory used four pi as a way to make indexing the whole world. And I'll show you in a minute that also alternative theories of gravity and topic gravity make use of the four pi in the holographic principle. So I can make a strange statement. Um, um, I go to the questions later. Uh, I I, uh, I can also make strange statements if someone from another universe calls you, which is very unlikely, and tells you what kind of universe are you living in, then uh, the answer would be probably we live in a four pi universe. Um, then uh, in physics, we all know there are the three big questions uh, is there a unification between general relativity and quantum mechanics? How do they relate? What is the nature of dark matter? Is it a particle or is it a field? What is the nature of dark energy? Well, the universe as a hologram from Shushkind has given us a new handle to uh, address these topics. And actually, Eric Verlinde, which is one of our speakers in, uh, in our information universe, came as a very heroic theory that all these three problems can be solved in one go, uh, building on the holographic principle in the universe. And the whole universe being entangled, uh, which uh, there's probably the answer to the chat question, uh, entanglement in physics is can be seen as the equivalent of Ken's in the in the, in the in vitro universe. Then, uh, yeah, I, uh, let me dwell a little bit upon uh, the emergent gravity model of Eric Verlinde. He models the gravity as an entropic force, and entropic forces are becoming more and more uh, emergent in physics. It's a macroscopic force, which is emergent because of microscopic behavior. Uh, think of an O lamp, O lamp with osmotic pressure, pressure and the flow of the fluid to the wick. Gravity is derived in this way from information as an emergent uh, force. The location of matter is, is measured 
uh, by means of entropy. When something moves, there's a change of information. When there's a change of information, there's a change of entropy, and that uh, leads to gravity. Again, this is based on the holographic principle. That's pretty, pretty uh, heroic, and he even went one step further. Well, in the derivation of gravity, he reproduced also the Newton law that gravity is related to the radius of a sphere squared, so it's called the area law, which is actually the number of pixels, pixels, bits that you can put on the surface of an area of a sphere. He also postulated that the entropy uh, uh, in our universe is due to entanglement of dark energy with all the rest. So the universe is filled with dark energy all over the place and is entangled with the matter in this place. And it derives a volume, a volume law for this entanglement. That's strange. You have an area law as r to the power 2 and a volume law as r to the power 3. And actually, the ratio between the area law and the volume law leads to a characteristic acceleration at which dark matter e emerges as a result of the interaction between the dark energy and the uh, cavity. So that is a very strange notion because there is a conflict between when you have a physical process with a R to the thir third cube law and a R squared law, there's a particular range at which, at which the two gets stressed. Um, that strange, that range, that radius is actually the radius at which dark matter emerges around galaxies. Uh, I'll show you that in a minute. But you can make the, 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 the strange statement that the universe contains dark matter for the same reason that an elephant has a very uh, sensitive skin. I, I quote here uh, Eric's uh, at the bottom of the slide, a statement from Eric. The observe, uh, he can word it better than I can do. The observed phenomena that are currently attributed to dark matter are this consequence of the emergent nature of the cavity and are caused by elastic response due to the volume law contribution to the entanglement and property in our universe. This is the whole story I, I made just in one sentence. All right. Um, we are in a fortunate position that we can test these models. And the way we test it is by means of weak gravitational lensing which is the effect that if you look at a very distant galaxy, uh, when it's light from the very distant galaxy travels through space, it's bent because of the curvature of, of space nearby foreground galaxies. So distant galaxies are a little bit deformed. Uh, the light beams of distant galaxies are a little bit deformed by the foreground galaxies. That is weak lensing. Well, you don't know the original shape of these galaxies. So the only way to understand what how this happens, what is the effect of this, is doing statistics. And that's what we're doing in, in weak lensing. We build massive statistics. We stack the signal of millions and in this nuclear satellite, billions of galaxies. And this way, by meaning by st stacking the signal, we get radio profiles of the dark matter. Um, there is another crossover of in vivo and vitro. That's why I like to show this this graph also in this context, right? General relativity is on the left side is what nature is doing with the light, and in vitro is here on I have Turing on the upper left side, right side, where we have petabytes of data in our computers modeling what is going on. Um, so this is one of the results from ground-based uh, observations with the same effect of weak lensing. Uh, it shows the accelerations um, as measured from the weak lensing, which is the top, top line, or the bottom, the dashed line, is what you would expect from Newtonian graphics if there was no dark matter. So you can see this weak lensing. We have a very accurate map, a very accurate map method to measure the, the weak, uh, measure the dark matter out to enormous radii outside of galaxies. We're talking here about megaparsec scales. 
Well, this is a fantastic way to test all these different models and all these different ideas. Well, the, the current state is that entropic gravity, which is the line here, predicts this behavior. The alternative idea uh, model of gravity in the mond, uh, it fits it, but it has three parameters. And the simulations of lambda CDM also can make it, but there's a lot of fine tuning in the simulations. So the jury is still out. We don't know. We could not, we cannot discriminate. And that's why we built the Jupiter satellite uh, to go one step further. And uh, here, just for fun, uh, the, the uh, launching of the Euclid satellite uh, in the first July last year in my theater in Groningen. And uh, the Euclid satellite will map the whole extragalactic sky and it will do this with an collect an enormous amount of data within more than an hour. It will get as much data as the Hubble telescope did in 100 days. Um, it will map the whole sky. Uh, we get the data from about 2 billion galaxies over the last 10 billion years. And we built the tomography of the nearby universe. And by deriving the kind of relation I just showed for this deep universe, we can look at the evolution of these different effects. And the idea is here, and that's the basic reason why this mission is perceived, when we uh, studied the evolution of these parameters, we can discriminate between the different models. So the jury is still out. Uh, and this is the and the part of my presentation, which has been shown in different places. But I couldn't resist showing two slides, which is completely new. Uh, and I really like to share that with you. Uh, it's uh, based on the book from Thomas Hertog, which just appeared uh, last year, end of last year. We worked with uh, Stefan Hocken for the last uh, 20 years of his life um, and came with a completely new holistic view of the universe. Um, the big change with the original idea of Stefan Hawking that you work down up, you start with the beginning of the universe and you work your way towards the current universe, they reversed the whole thing. They said there is no beginning, we start from top, we start from here. And we see the universe as one, uh, one holistic framework where entanglement is done by one big overarching wave function connecting everything in the universe. Which is a rather heroic uh, uh, statement. And it's completely the reverse of what uh, Orkin said, which is no boundary uh, ideas in the, in the first, uh, in his first theories. So in this holistic view, the origin and the cause and the observations and the questions and the evolution and the dynamics in the universe become one unit, go together in one unit in an overarching holistic framework with the overarching uh, wave function. The physical laws in that framework are emerging. Uh, it's all Darwinian. It's all very messy, even the physical, the creation of the physical laws. Of course, they become strict. There's no multiverse. Uh, and even Earth alive and human could follow this uh, paradigm. And actually, uh, which I find a notion which is inter very interesting to, to, to note, that if this is all the case, our universe is likely unique. There is no multiverse. There is no, the universe just is there. It is. There is no point in other universes. And uh, Thomas Hattoff even goes that far, saying, well, also our civilization is unique. Um, and in the same context. Um, I'm not to have don't have the time to dwell on it now for too long, but I find this a very interesting and new view, and it's also a very new view on the position of humans here on Earth in the universe. So, um, I go to the last slide, which just uh, reiterates some of the statements of uh, Horkin and Hattoff. There's no beginning. There is a no new no boundary interpretation of the beginning. It's our, the beginning is actually our, our horizon of time. There's no big plan or anything a priori baked in the laws. All the physical laws are emergent. But self-organizing and emergent patterns are all according to Darwinian principles. All down the tree, 
the symbiosis of physics and bioevolution in the same framework. And then they quote Darwin, 1882, principle of life result from one or the other overarching physical law. There we go. And Holocam Vru is also a quote, you, you have to throw out information until there are no qubits left over. That's the beginning. Well, that rings a bell because in the powers of two, we have uh, the power two to the power zero, which is a very strange one. It's the book starts with it, two to the power, two to the power zero is unity. And that matches actually to what uh, Hawking and Hat of are stating. So it's all very motivating to think about as new ideas. Um, um, for this seminar, uh, I think the bottom line is here. In fact, there is no last final theory. It's all liberating. There's no absolute truth, a plurality of sorts from arts to science. So let me stop here. I think I have already used too much time. And uh, there's a question uh, in the chat from Stephen Guerin. Maybe maybe Eric might want to step on to this one. Um, with relation to Edwin's description of the universality of links and Ken, in the spirit of the duality of Borinoy and Delaunay, graphs were links between become nodes and vice versa. Do you have any conceptual thinking around the duel of Ken? Now, I personally don't understand that, but it relates. Oh, sorry, I, I missed a few bits because my computer timed out for the, uh, <laughs> my audio oh. timed out. So, but I, I, I heard the last bit. Actually, if I, you, if you I, click, I, if you click on the chat. Yeah, I've seen it, I see it. Yeah, it's okay. So yeah, I, I, my notion of Ken is uh, I, I, I just want to find a name of all the different things like links and associations and references and even uh, entanglement associations. We all use these different words. And I find it so strange that we have no one single word. For it. And uh, because in on a very basic level, it's the same thing. Okay. And uh, you didn't hear me before, but do you have a short video you had mentioned to me? Yeah, I do, but I, I'm, I ran out of time, so it's up to the chair. You will better be no, doing No, 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 it's, it's fine. Why don't we show that short video before we move on to Mark? Okay, okay, okay. Then um, the introduction to the video is uh, I, I also operate a planetarium, which is a really meant as a crossing border planetarium. And... Um, where we, meet, where we meet with arts and science. And uh, I like to show this movie, which is uh, the illustrious uh, cosmic simulation, uh, um, where a, a pianist, a neoclassic pianist, Peter de Graaf, is playing live and uh, in our planetarium, inspired by the cosmos, actually. And uh, that goes, right? Not at all. This is just for fun.
Thank you. Um, I think now we'll do a, a brief uh, powers of 10 cosmic zoom uh, back to Telluride. And we'll welcome Mark Nayrink, who's sitting here in a room next to me. And uh, let's ask Mark to do his presentation. Right, so I, I am glad that Edwin showed that video. It was, it'll, the, I'll make reference to it um, uh, in my talk. So um, I'm basically going to talk about the origin of information in the universe, which is pretty grandiose, but um, th there are some things that we can say about that. Um, so the, sorry. Okay, so I'm going, going to talk about, say something about cosmological uh, structure formation for one thing, which Edwin said something about, but um, there's kind of a dichotomy between some the some primordial information that persists and determines some things in our universe, we think, and then there's, I, I think, th and this is a kind of an open question, but, um, but there's some uh, smaller scale um, information that I think is is not primordial, um, or at least is super chaotic. Um, so, but there is a there are some two kind of, sort of two regimes that I think are, it's not widely appreciated how these operate. Um, I'm also going to talk about some uh, how information sort of gets processed and some more familiar branching structures. Um, than the cosmic web, which I, which is sort of my main research topic. Um, these, so one example of well, so in, in this series, uh, the concepts of watersheds, has, has, um, the concept of a watershed has come up quite a bit, at least that I've seen, um, and it's a, a topic that's very that's important in the the Telluride Institute. So I want to say something about that. Um, so first, I'm going to show another movie. This is a collaboration with an artist, Emilia Skarniulte. I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, sorry. Um, but uh, what you're seeing here is, well, I'll start from the beginning again. At first, you don't really see anything. Um, but then gradually, you should see some, some structures starting to emerge. Um, I'm not claiming that this is an emergent thing, but um, uh, it's something that you don't see at first, but then it gradually comes into being. Um, this is, I think that this is an example of what uh, art can, well, what trying to be a little bit more artistic and in, in discussing these topics can do. Um, as a scientist, I'm, I usually try to show in, information <laughs> as, as a, efficiently as possible, but the actual experience of um, of structure formation in the universe, of course, happened over billions of years. And it's it's easy to forget how gentle the the primordial um, pattern of density fluctuations was that we think grew into the the, the current structure. So this is um, I, I didn't say what anything about what this is really, um, but this is a patch of a of the universe, uh, uh, it's actually a two-dimensional simulation rendered in a kind of unusual way where it's kind of like, um, it's a backlit, um, there's some dark matter that's dark and it's backlit from behind. Um, and there's there there's a good approximation in which the structure is, is sort of on a what's called the dark matter sheet, um, which is rendered here. Um, and it it doesn't look very much like um, what Edwin sh Edwin showed. Um, so the the in what Edwin showed, the there were nodes that there were sort of bubbles that developed, and those are only at the nodes of this network. Um, the the these ribbons, these pleats in the fabric are usually largely invisible. Those are the called filaments in the universe. Okay, so that was just a little. Hint of art. Um, uh, in the so, um, onto information. Um, so we think that that gravity um, folds up the, a sort of blueprint into what's called the cosmic web, 
and that is that that um, that this blueprint is uh, was developed during um, inflation during the first instance of the universe. So here, um, I hope you can see the my pointer. Um, the there there's some darker and lighter patches of this grid. Um, the the lighter patches have less material, um, and the the darker patches have more material. But it's it's there are very tiny um, differences between the the densities in in the blue and the um, and the green patches. But of course, amplified quite a bit, so you can actually see them. Um, as the so gravity just pulls denser patches together, and you end up with this kind of process. Um, and that that's kind of cool, but um, there's a there's actually kind of an open question: How much does this actually determine? How do how much does this primordial um, uh, this primordial blueprint, which is information, that's what I'm calling primordial information, how much does that determine? What does that determine? Does it determine what happens inside a galaxy? To what to what degree uh, could you predict that the Earth was here from from this primordial patch of information. So yeah, what um, what what on Earth was encoded in the initial conditions of the universe? That's actually not very well known. It's kind of surprisingly. Um, was life well? Was life in general? Was life was our particular form of life? Was was presentation? I kind of doubt it, but um, it's kind of an open question. Um, and but if if we move out in scale, we reach some some things where we actually do know a fair amount. Um, but even the on the scale of the solar system, um, it's uncertain whether the details of this of the solar system were prescribed in the primordial universe. It, um, my guess is that it wasn't particularly, although it's not a particularly unusual solar system. There's some distribution of possible solar systems that could have come out and ours is not ridiculously atypical, but who knows? Um, but the, the the details of the masses of each of our planets is probably, it's not it's probably not prescribed entirely by this initial pattern of fluctuations, um, was our galaxy. Well, here I um, we start to get to a, a large enough size that I think it's pretty certain that there, that the primordial pattern of fluctuations prescribed that there would be a galaxy here, but it's actually not so clear what kind of galaxy it would be, um, or to the degree to which these fluctuations determine our, our galaxy. And then there's extragalactic scales. Um, this is also the, the illustrious simulation, another rendering of it, um, the, the same simulation that Edwin showed. Um, so the 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 there, there's a this cosmic web which is a, a pattern of, of filaments um, connecting large galaxies together, and those th that seems to be laid down by these um, this initial primordial information. Um, but the yeah, there's a if we also look out into more rural parts of the universe in um, these. Uh, white patches. <laughs> I haven't defined what this is, but what's what's shown here is uh, actually the same um, two-dimensional simulation as a, as the 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 gently moving simulation movie um, had. So the so here the the white patches are um, places where this there's kind of a um, a sheet that gets stretched out from the from the initial universe very, very much. Um, that's where the universe expanded faster than the average, and so there's kind of a sheet stretched over the universe that gets that gets that gets stretched out even further. Um, and between these these patches, though, there are these filaments. Those are where this sheet folds up, um, and finally, in these nodes, um, that's for those are galaxies basically where where the where the folds get more even well more complicated than you you would likely be able to fold from from paper um and actually in these white regions where 
they're called single stream regions or voids. Um, those are places where uh, where there aren't where the actual actually this primordial information seems to be preserved quite well. Um, it's kind of ironic that those are also nearly impossible to observe. <laughs> so you you get perfect um, primordial information pre preservation exactly where you can observe it. Um, so that's yeah kind of funny. Um, but uh, but within these um, these filaments there there's a lot more going on so for for example we are in these filaments and that's um this so obviously there's more going on than just a gently expanding um pattern of fluctuations um so why so why is this um one one way to understand it is in terms of crossing times I, this is a boring wall of text but um but as we go out and scale, the time scales get longer and longer. Um, the solar system has a crossing time of sort of years, which is pretty um, pretty fast by by astronomical standards. But um, but it seems well historically, of course, the solar system has seemed to be a, a very uh, orderly thing. The word cosmos, of course, means order, and that's we thought that was a lot more orderly than whatever was going on on Earth, so, um, which is kind of true, but that's partially because some instabilities have long gone away or um, been excited, and so we're left with stuff that's pretty stable. Um, if, we, if we go out to a galaxy, there, well, the rotation period of the galaxy is a large fraction of a billion years. If we go out to filament scales, one of these filaments that I showed, um, there's kind of a rotational time scale of billions of years, which actually we helped to discover. Um, and but in a void, in one of these pristine patches, there's no matter crossing at all, really. But um, there's some caveats, but because there are some outflows from galaxies, but in general, there's just nothing <laughs> crossing, and so you don't get any um, flows that could be excited there. Or some no no chaotic chaotic dynamics or turbulence that could be excited there. Um, okay, so the the cl collapsed regions of the universe, like galaxies, this is where it's an open question. I think how much non primordial information there is. Um, so the, here's a a figure from a um, paper by Shai Janel et al. Um, where it, it shows the high amount of chaos that occurs in a galaxy. Um, so it, it's, a it's a time sequence of a galaxy. Um, and uh, we start from, from when the universe was 0.8 million years old, and then we proceed on, until the universe is almost as old as it is now, uh, 10 billion years old. Um, and what they did was they uh, set up two different simulations. Um, one was a copy of the other, and in this shadow B, um, they made tiny, tiny um, perturbations to all of the particle positions. These are all, all of these are made up of lots of little particles that the computer tra keeps track of. And um, they tracked, well, they ran the simulation in both cases, and, um, and they ended up with two different Quite different looking galaxies. Um, and they even a long time ago, uh, billions of years ago, they looked somewhat different. Um, it's it's a little bit of an open question how much of this is numerical rather than physical. Um, well, maybe more than a little bit. <laughs> there, there's definitely an ambiguity whether it's the computer simulations that and the numerics of that that caused this that um, exacerbate these differences. But it's there are also some arguments that would that the the numerics tend to suppress the differences so it but it's 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 a big open question um and this is so I, I won't go deeply into this but this kind of shows how much chaos some degree of some measure of the degree of of chaos in different environments of the universe this is from a paper that um was from a couple of years ago um, that I, that from me um, and also the same guy from the, the previous slide, Shai Janelle. Um, what it shows is uh, 
uh, in different colors, the amount of basically chaos. So it's kind of a Lyapunov exponent or um, actually what's actually shown here is the is how much the the factor by which the the initial perturbation is um, is enhanced when you go from the 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 epoch when the perturbation was uh, was introduced very long time ago until today and these these yellow patches are where basically the you you can't even predict which side of the galaxy this um, this particle will be on, whereas in the in the rural re regions of the universe in these voids there's um, you can predict very well where the the matter is going to be. So that's just to to um, uh, put some quantitative um, some numbers on there, and so you end up with the factor of a million more uncertainty in where particle is going to to end up. So this is this is chaos. It's not. It, it's actually not very. It shouldn't be very surprising. Um, but okay. I'm, but so that so that's one aspect of what's going on. The the um, you get more and more sensitivity to the initial pattern of fluctuations. But also, I think. Um, but also, there are some processes that in a galaxy that can amplify very small scale um, uh, perturbations up to larger scales. So it's not all the primordial fluctuations that that could carry, um, that, that, that determine with higher and higher uh, uh, sensitivity what happens at later times. Um, there are also some things that, um, that happen which I think could could broadcast um, uh, new information if there is any uh, to the scale of a gal galaxy. So, um, so one example um, is in black hole triples, um, or any, actually any sort of uh, triple system. Uh, the so the the three body problem is well known as a very chaotic system, and um, it actually isn't has hasn't been that long since sort of this year that the consequences of that kind of there's became clear. So there's this paper by Charta, Charta Buchholz et al. Um, and a couple of other ones going back a few years, which um, which point out that if if even you don't know the the positions of black, of black holes in a triple to Planck length uncertainty, um, which we think is impossible to know with that level of precision. Um, eventually, a lot of these systems um, are, chaotic, are chaotic enough, in some instance at least, to produce uh, astronomical scale um, differences in where the black holes are. So meaning that it looks completely different. The system looks completely different. And there's also turbulence. There's a lot of turbulence in the universe um, in these rural areas of voids between galaxies, there's not much turbulence, but within galaxies, there, there's more turbulent flow really than non-turbulent flow. Um, and uh, there, there's, people have been working in the flow dynamics community, the turbulence community, um, on this thing called spontaneous stochasticity, which is, has a, a few different names and it gets a bit confusing, but um, what it can do is, um, is and it's not really even a mechanism; it's just a, a degree of chaos. Um, in a lot of cases, in the case of this this paper here, Bumbeck et al. 2024, um, they showed that even little thermal noise in the atmosphere eventually, in a tur well in the turbulent atmosphere, it it um, comes to change the weather. <laughs> um, so it's it's so it's it's not the butterfly effect; it's a molecule effect, even the the motions of, of molecules uh, on tiny scales um, make the universe, make the, sorry, make the weather kind of in principle in, unpredictable on a couple of week time scales. Um, and there's, so actually there is some, uh, it seems like Lorenz, the kind of founder of chaos theory, um, kind of realized this, although he, that kind of got lost a little bit. 
um, he said that there were three different uh, sort of regimes of predictability. One is high predictability where you can just predict arbitrarily long in the future that so the in cosmology those are that happens in the void regions between galaxies um there's the second thing which is the usual butterfly effect where um well i can just read it the air the air eventually becomes much larger larger than the, the initial error but um but you can make that that um final conditions error arbitrarily small by making by shrinking the size of the initial error. Um, and then there's the third third one, which I think, which seems to be actually the generic situation, even though it's not what's usually thought of in the butterfly effect. And that's that for any particular, well, the, the error eventually becomes much larger than the initial error. Okay, that's the same as two. But for any particular future time, there's a limit below which the error cannot be reduced. No, no matter how small the initial error, if not zero is made. So that means um, it, it's a very strange situation where uh, it, 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 it matters whether the error is exactly zero or any other quantity. Um, you, you get a huge different difference after, uh, in the atmosphere's case, a couple of weeks. Um, but um, if that, but it is a, in principle, a dynamical, uh, sorry, a deterministic system where if, if everything is exactly the same, um, you still get the same thing. So it's very, so I guess the point of this is that you need only a tiny perturbation in the case of this, this paper, uh, the, by Bandak et al, they showed that, um, that just a tiny thermal fluctuation is enough to cause large differences at late times. Um, and uh, this is just for some graphical, well, a, some quantitative um, graphics about this. Um, I won't explain this in detail, of course, but they, this is from some computer simulations of Kelvin Hol Helmholtz uh, instabilities, which I make these little spiral structures in, um, in clouds, for example. For example. Um, what they did was they started, they did a similar thing as what I talked about before, where they have two different simulations with little differences at early times, and um, say that they see how much those separations grow. Um, so they started these three different simulations with different separations, uh, still very tiny, but differing by orders of magnitude. And after after some amount of time, they all kind of the separation all kind of separations all kind of line up together. So you can't tell just, just from the final separations how how large the initial separation was. Um, and I think this kind of thing could happen in, in galaxies. Um, one mechanism is uh, something that, that broadcasts very small scale stuff to larger scales, which is called um, active galactic nuclei. So what happens in that case is when, well, there's generally a black hole in the center of a galaxy. And when matter comes and some of it falls into the galaxy, um, there's a lot of energy released um, in these things called jets that um, that seem to have a, a fair amount of uh, dependence on the details within this accretion disk. So that's something that I'm trying to work on um, to quantify how much chaos there is in the system and whether um, just a little bit of thermal um, fluctuation within the disk can broadcast things to, to um, we could could broadcast a, a fluctuation, a meaningful fluctuation to the scale of a galaxy. Um, okay, so I guess things are it's time to start wrapping up or maybe finish, <laughs> be in the middle of wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to say a couple more things. Um, one is that uh, actually the the amount of primordial information that's in a patch of the universe uh, universe that forms a galaxy is maybe surprisingly small, um, especially in a in a dark, in particular dark matter models. So this there there's WDM and CDM. Um, these are names of dark matter models. Um, in, in this case, it's this called warm dark matter. Um, there's it's a pretty smooth um, primordial pattern of fluctuations that that you get, and all of 
these three patches all are the size or have the basically all the the sufficient mass and large scale density contrast. It's their their large scale hills of the density field. Um, they all end up as sort of a galaxy, and it's kind of I think it doesn't make sense that you could get all of the structure in our galaxy from this blob. <laughs> um, you would need either a different dark matter model, so something like this, which it's actually unresolved. I, I mean, the, the actual density uh, fluctuations are, are much smaller scale than this. Um, you would need a lot more inf primordial information to be able to build a galaxy from that. You can't really build a galaxy from that. Um, so also, if there's some limit to the primordial information to primordial information density, so an example of a of an information bound is the Bekenstein bound, which um, comes from considerations similar, uh, well, that Edwin um, mentioned um, about black hole information content. Um, it's hard to imagine that all of the information in the galaxy or even on Earth could have resided within some reasonable primordial patch, I think. But there, it's a slippery concept, though. So I, I, I'm, it's hard to make a super completely definitive statement. Um, and in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to just mention, just flash some branching structures um, here in neurons. Uh, there was slime mold and um, architectural structures. This is a, a spider web, um, a blown up spider web. And that's a slime mold that I did. Uh, and actually, um, there's a art ex there's an ex art exhibit that is just ending in Los Alamos that has slime molds in that shape. Mycelium. So the Telluride has mushroom festivals, and so it's very um, pertinent here. And lungs. There's some other branching structures. Um, roads, especially if weighted by the traffic on them. Um, this cosmic web, which I was my main topic, and body, the circulatory system, and hydrology. So I'm going to show watersheds, and this will be really the last minute or two. Um, so this is the Colorado Plateau, shown um, the an elevation map of that, and you can see a bunch of interesting um, rivers and tributaries here. Uh, the the elevation here, well, the color here shows the the elevation. Um, here's New Zealand. Um, uh, but what I wanted to to emphasize here is that um, there's an, an, a good analogy to what happens in the universe um, uh, with with the cosmic web with the flows of water. So um, I I think that it shouldn't be too shouldn't require a huge amount of ex explanation <laughs> to just point out on this picture that water kind of flows downhill um, and then ends up in a valley where, where there's a, a river or a tributary. Um, and what happens, well, things are completely deterministic on the hillside and things just go downhill. But then um, when you, once you get into a river, you don't know what direction uh, a water, the, a particular parcel of water is going. It'll be generally going down the uh, downstream, but um, there can be turbulence in the river, of course. Um, and in particular, when you get two, um, two rivers coming together, um, there's a confluence and, um, and that generates turbulence. Um, actually, as I write up here, galaxies form at cosmic Confluences. So, um, so generally, the the galaxies in the universe form at um, form where different filaments are coming together, and so a confluence is sort of like a galaxy. Um, and there's dissipation going on. I know that Eric has worked on the dissipative systems. Um, so this this kind of turbulent motion is one way that the second law of thermodynamics is is uh, satisfied which um, I don't have time to explain much more about, but that's all for my talk. Um, one thing, one little summary of some of it is that galaxies are highly chaotic and there may be a, a, lot, a fair amount of 
information that's injected beyond what was in the primordial universe. Um, but there are also more rural parts of the universe called voids, where they're kind of like hillside, hillsides where you can deterministically know what direction the matter is flowing. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mark. Um, we only have a few minutes. So we can run a little longer. Um, what I'm noticing in these three presentations uh, is uh, an issue of language, semantics, and scale that we're zooming around in and actually uh, integrating in ways that uh, are really difficult to comprehend as we change scale. Uh, and I'm curious about we're talking a lot about chaos, about thermodynamics, entropy, uh, and yet life um, is, and uh, much of what some people refer to as the noosphere, this, the biosphere and noosphere, both Vernadsky uh, terms originally, um, is negentropic. Uh, and I'm, I've always been curious, or maybe not, Eric's shaking his head there, maybe. Uh, I'm just curious about the scale issues. So are, if we are essentially, as all life is, somehow tuned to the larger, uh, just like watersheds and, and the cosmos, we're, we're very commonly tuned. Uh, how do we think about information at the scale of what's going on on Earth and the development of our tools and our abilities to perceive and attempt to understand what we're describing here. I, I find that a just a huge question mark still. Maybe I'm not clear. No, it's all good. Um, goodness, you know, asked about what is the universe or inheriting Shakespeare for a day. There's no way you can answer. Um, but if we wanted to say something general, a thing we've all experienced is that you ask one question or what you intend before you say it is a certain question and then somebody else answers a different one. So much of doing anything right involves getting clear what question you're asking and being sure that the guy who heard it heard the same thing that you meant to ask. All of this business about neg entropy and blah, blah, blah has to do with starting out talking about one thing and then suddenly shifting to talking about something else and not having marked where you made the shift. That's not a genuine problem. That's just that we don't speak in complete sentences. So there's a lot of stuff like that that we can repair just with a little bit of patience and talking in complete sentences. Um, I mean, Mark answered one of what my most intrigued pressing questions was on this. From dynamical systems, we understand the notion of finite time singularities, things for which there's so much instability that short of strict identity, you can't extend prediction beyond some horizon that doesn't go forever. And of course, the notion of strict identity only occurs in a deterministic system. If you are talking about classical observables in the universe, even if you have a non-chaotic underlying quantum state, if you're in a world of decoherent histories or, you know, people use the word many worlds, I'm not worried about the, the word, but basically um, decoherence, decoherence has a characteristic non-zero scale. And so all of these classical phenomena and galaxies and what that we observe involve phenomena in classical observables that are within these decoherent histories. I think Mark demonstrated that there's a lot of stuff that would not be predictable just from the non-zero scale at which decoherence occurs. This is the kind of stuff Seth Lloyd writes about in his book. I think it's titled Computing a Universe or something like that. So a lot of this has to do with the fact that you ask contingent questions about the late world with a lot of structure in it, and your answers are about those ensembles. And those are different questions from answers about primordial quantum fluctuations and so forth. All of that we can do to some extent, but we first want to try to understand each other in doing it. Is that fair to both of you, Mark and Edwin? 
Um, yes, I, I would agree with that generally. Um, I, uh, Edwin? Uh, I, um, sorry, not for nothing that I presented this uh, new ideas of Stefan Hawken and uh, and, uh, and Thomas. Um, what we are discussing, bottom up, bottom up versus top down, right? And uh, as an astronomer, I'm I'm really <laughs> observer, observation astronomer. I'm used to work top down, right? Because in the, in the fifty years of my career, we went deeper into the universe. We went top down and started to understand from where we are now. Well, if you want to go bottom up, right, which Hawken originally wanted to do, and that's what all this discussion is about, right? Can you go bottom up? Um, I think the insight is that bottom up is probably not not going to work because the universe is so terribly messy, and you say it in different different terms, but the universe is so terribly messy uh, and uh, so terribly Darwinian that um, uh, the bottom-up one is going to give you issues. Is that a reflection on what we you are just discussing? Or... Yeah. yeah, indeed. And, and uh, the strange thing is that, you know, I, I find this very far-reaching is that um, with the uh, top-down equation of the universe, a la Hawking and Co. and, and Thomas, is that, you know, there's one universal um, equation of state of the whole universe, right? And we just observe it. And there are many sub levels on it, uh, which makes our universe, it is. That's their statement, eh? it is. And if we want to, uh, and it has a lot of consequences. It has consequences, I, I didn't have time to go there, but it might have the consequence that we are unique as humankind, as intelligent life in the universe. And that's another paper by Thomas, right? Um, we might be very unique. Maybe we are the only civilization in the world. Uh, and um, in Mbito, uh, well, I can I, I can dwell on, on, on that for a long time. Um, the Drake equation falls apart if you, uh, if you think about this. And... Um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry. I think we want to be a little bit self-reflective about this too, though. If we're going to talk about laws of nature, all of the things that we put forth as laws of nature admit a lot of particular outcomes. If they didn't, then they wouldn't, there would be no distinction between what we call a law of nature and just an infinitely fine-grained description of the situation in which we find ourselves. So it's the whole project of thinking and trying to recognize where there are natural joints in nature where you can carve that lies behind the search for laws. And so to talk about getting all of the details of the particular from laws of nature is a mixed metaphor because you're asking for different things. And this is not a deep observation. It's just kind of a little bit of hygiene in thinking and in conversation to, you know, to figure out what you're trying to engage with. I think you're right. And, uh, of course, the, the physical laws are strict. But in this 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 uh, perception, even the physical laws are emergent. Also being strict, but still emergent. At this point, uh, we're coming to a close. So I want to thank our presenters, Edwin, Eric, Mark. Thank you very much for participating in this program. Um, we're, we're going to have another uh, Zoom in one hour, approximately, a little over. Um, I just, for the people listening in and viewing, I just want to let them know that uh, in an hour or so, we're going to have Sean Brixey and Joshua Garland um, presenting. Sean is uh, an artist, uh, an educator. He has a undergraduate degree in physics, and most of his work has dealt with issues of information and physics and uh, uh, photonics and such. And uh, he's going to describe um, a project he's doing that's uh, uh, related to Mars. Uh, and uh, Joshua Garland is actually a researcher at ASU, and he's going to deal with a very human 
and social side of the information environment, a different scale, a much more local scale issue of disinformation, misinformation, information warfare, and those issues. Uh, just very different scale and, and language and understandings, and yet also part of this information environment that humans are playing within, uncovering and exploring as we are here through the arts, through the sciences. I invite people to tune in in an hour for the next program and over the next few days through Friday as we have a number of presentations looking at just a few of the many ways of uh, looking at, thinking about, and trying to understand this single word, information, uh, which more and more has great importance in our lives as we uh, just easily throw that word around without really deep understanding that's going to be necessary for, um, for our survival with any kind of quality on this planet and in making decisions about uh, issues like climate, like economics, like um, human population future. Um, I think we're, unless we gra actually attempt to better understand what we're talking about when we say information, uh, we're not gonna be able to make the kinds of decisions necessary about these so-called grand challenges. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. It's good to see you all. Yeah. Yes, yeah, see you, thank see you, you offline you, see you soon yeah. other in other ways. Eric, your day is just starting. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> bye bye.